Hello and welcome to Property Summits, essential viewing for landlords, investors and developers alike, where our panel of experts keep you up to date with the very latest in the property world. I'm Emma Birchley and joining me today are five men who together represent a property portfolio worth a staggering £1.5 billion. Pounds. Now, Nicholas Woolwork is a seasoned property developer and investor who is CEO of the world's largest international property forum, also with me is Richard Bush, founder of the crowdfunding platform Crowdlords, which gives more people the chance to invest in property. Here too is Tony Gimple, who knows all there is to know about the private rental sector and is a leading advisor when it comes to tax planning. And finally in the studio with me is John Howard, a real expert when it comes to property, having bought and sold more than 3,500 houses, apartments and developments in the UK. And of course, we mustn't forget property entrepreneur Paul Mahoney, joining us all the way from Australia, founder of Nova Financial Group, which provides property investment advice with a particular focus on buy-to-let. It's lovely to be here with you all today. So we are going to focus on alternative sources of funding. Now, Richard, you know about this. Crowd Lords is your business. Tell me. Um, what, what does it mean? Essentially what we're talking about is anything um, where we're raising money from a source that is not the banks. So when you're doing property development or whether you're buying buy-to-let property, you need cash. And um, typically a proportion of that cash will come in as debt and traditionally that debt has come from the bank. Since about 2010, there have been alternative ways of, of raising money. Property developers and landlords have always, always borrowed from friends and family or issued their own loan notes to raise debt directly. But now there are platforms like ours that will enable you to raise money from everyday people, whether it's debt or whether it's equity, so that you can do your development or do your buy-to-let. But there's such a range that not everything is right for everybody. So it's worth us discussing the pros and cons of going direct or using a platform or borrowing from mum and dad um, because there are benefits and, and disbenefits from, from each way of doing it. So do you have to be brave to go for something different, something that's a bit new maybe? Well, if you're borrowing money, essentially, you know, you don't really care. Um, assuming the terms are, are the same, I, I'd, I'd happily borrow, well, maybe not John, but I'll happily borrow from, <laughs> from Nick. Oh, Interest rate will be too high, obviously. <laughs> Um, is, I, don't, I think if you're borrowing money, it's not so much you need to be careful, but I think it's important to understand what money you're borrowing, what security you're giving, and how much you're paying for that debt, because it can vary significantly, as I'm sure we'll talk about. So, obviously, a lot of people, when they're first getting into having their home, first rung of the ladder, you might borrow a deposit from mum and dad. That's, that's the most basic element uh, to understand. What else is there, John? Oh, crikey. I mean... It, this all goes back really 30, 40 years ago, there was only the main clearing banks, you know, the, the ones we all know about, who would really, you'd go to to borrow property, m money for property. Uh, and the most you could probably borrow was 50%. And Richard remembers those days, Tony remembers those days, I'm afraid the other two don't. However, that, that over the years has all changed. And suddenly there's all these bridging companies. Um, in the old days, you'd only go to a bridging company as a very, very last resort. And there was only two or three in the country you could go to. Now there's literally hundreds of uh, lending institutions that will lend you money at quite high interest rates. And this is where you've got to be careful. Uh, these, in my view, they're not banks, they're bridging companies. And if you're going to borrow from them, make sure you've got a set limit time-wise that you're going to pay it back in. Don't leave it open-ended. They won't let you leave it open-ended anyway. But of course, if you go over the period that you've set yourself, and they've set yourself to repay them, they will charge you a lot more money, interest-wise. But Richard knows far more about that than I ever will. So is it the case that you might go for these alternative sources of funding because you can't get all the money you need from the bank? Is, is that why you do it? Yeah, it's kind of a, it can be used as a top-up to bank lending in many cases, um, depending on the structure and the setup and the company involved. I think what John's tried to say is that there's a lot of different companies out there now. And they'll Huge lend amount. Huge amount. different levels of the deal, you know, whether it's the bank debt at the cheapest level, the next tranche on top of that is sort of mezzanine debt, I guess you'd best describe it. Um, and then you're sort of into equity debt, which is sort of you know, real cash. It might be your deposit, it might be someone else's. 
and they lend at all different levels in the in the finance. I mean, it, it has changed so much, Emma. What do you got to remember? In the old days, you'd borrow fifty percent from the bank, and then you you'd have fifty percent cash somehow from might be you, my mother was very kind to me early on. She got a good return, as you would expect, from <laughs> someone with a name called Howard, and uh, and so on. But but. You know that's that's all you could do. Now there's so many so many ways of of, of, of funding and borrowing money. Um, it's remarkable, really. And you can have different combinations. In, you, you you have your bank debt, and then you have yeah. your, your I mean, mezzanine I mean some, level, or depending what, you know. what level you're at in terms of your in terms of your career. In a way, I suppose how long have you been doing it? I mean, we still go to a bank, um, and we would put down forty percent cash. And they'd put down 60% loan to loan to value, and that's how we do it. But there's so many other ways of doing it. Um, yeah, aren't there, Richard? I mean, yeah. I mean, the <coughs> as John says, you know, typically in the past you would have had the cash yourself to put alongside the bank money, and probably up until about five years ago, the banks were lending up to 75% of the value. So as long as you had 25%, that was fine. Now, to get a good rate, you might limit what you borrow from the bank down to around 55-60%. So where are you going to get the other 40% from? You can save it, you can sell other assets, but essentially the more you leverage, the more profit you'll make on your return on your own equity, and the bigger the project you can do if you borrow more. You could do multiple projects if you borrow more, or if you get investment, but you have to pay it back. And so it's a case of working out what's right for each individual project. Yeah. And in many case, cases, you can do a joint venture, you know, where you raise all the money from somebody else and you do the work and they provide the debt and the equity and, and share in the profit. So th th there's just an infinite... So they're more passive and you're the one doing the You're the, the one doing work. the work and they're providing yeah. the finance. I, yeah. And you've brought the, deal, you've brought the deal to them. Yeah. Um, I, I, and, you know, I've had in financial backers all my career. You know, I've done stuff on my own and with, my, and with partners, but also with financial backers and there's nothing wrong with that at all so so i've now come full circle where where we are investing in other people's deals and supporting other developers less experienced than ourselves so really it's amazing how it's just changed so much is this something that that you go for paul do you do you go for these alternative sources of funding something that we, we've been involved for, you know, from a business perspective yeah, for a number of years um uh, it led the whole, you know, the alternative lending space, uh, you know, there's many different lenders involved. I think that's something that's worth considering as well, is it may all seem like one product, but actually lots of different lenders approach it in different ways. And sometimes they don't really deliver on what they promise. Um, you know, for, I, I've actually personally had a bad experience with this recently where a lender promised me they could lend within 14 days, four or five months passed by, and, and I still didn't have the money. Um, and the, the biggest problem was that I was getting the property too cheap. And I said, well, what business are we in? You know, if I'm not buying it too cheap, I'm doing something wrong. So, so that's, that's something to be aware of is, you know, you can't just go with any lender because some of them promise to be super flexible and great and don't actually end up being so once it gets to their, you know, lending committee and all that sort of thing. Um, but that's different to what Richard does. And, you know, it's just, I think it's that, that does add in the value of sort of dealing especially if you're inexperienced, because bridging has been opened up to in, in, inexperienced people. I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. Um, you know, historically, it's been more for experienced developers that are looking to bridge a gap in money, which is you know, the whole um, name that's associated with it. Should you really be going into your first development with you know, expensive short-term debt? You know, I, I, I don't know, that would depend. <laughs> On, on how successful you are, I suppose, but sometimes that's what can be, bring people unstuck, is not realizing the cost of that debt. What John mentioned, you know, usually if you go over your initial term, which from what I've seen, most inexperienced developers, it takes them longer and it costs them more money than they first expected. So they don't factor in that the cost of the debt longer term, and that can really, you know, crumble things. I, th I think what Paul's about to touch on is regulation. And I think the way that's controlled in our industry is with different uh, levels of regulation depending on the product. So Richard's business is FCA compliant. There's a very, very high level 
of regulation because the people he's often dealing with might be lots and lots of smaller investors, consumer investors that need more protection. They're not as savvy or knowledgeable or sophisticated as some higher level investors. Um, for example, in Rebric, we work, um, Rebric's my development company, we work with private investors, but it's a minimum of 100,000 investments. And what that means is we're only allowed to work with sophisticated or high net worth investors. And that's a term that's um, put out there by the FCA that means that we can't speak to the kind of clients that Richard speaks to because we're not allowed to. We're not allowed to sell to them. So by having a slightly higher entry level and a, a certain type of client, we're hitting a different part of the market, but it's still alternate finance. Um, but you've got to you know, be careful who you're, you're lending from because you, know, you don't want um, you know, an unregulated product where someone's putting their entire life savings into um, when it's not properly looked after and their interests are looked after as well. So you've got to be very careful who you borrow from. You know, being susceptible to the vagaries of somebody else's life, you know, be it not so much on an institutional side, but certainly when it's private individuals, you know, can leave you in the lurch. You know, so you've got to make sure that they've got wills, powers of attorney, you're not suddenly you know, in bed with their spouse, partner. You know, um, where's your exit route? What happens if the deal goes wrong? How are you going to get it out? How are they going to get out? So it's really important you know, to do due diligence on whomever you're lending to, borrowing from, and understanding the exit route. The other big issue is you know, people think about limited companies, you know, the veil of incorporation. It's really easy to lift these days. And on, you see a lot of questions on social media, you know, especially for people who have incorporated their business, whether it's an SPV, you know, that the, the lender is still asking for a personal guarantee. Sure. You know, and they're scratching their head and say, well, why do I need to give a, a personal guarantee? Well, if you're first time out, you know, you've never done it before, you've got some real issues. Yeah, Tony, I, you looked at me when you said you've got some real issues, which does concern me. My oh. only real issue is every time I do a deal, <laughs> even now, we have to sign a personal guarantee. Yeah. It may only be for the top 20% slice of the loan or something like that, but don't think anybody out there is going to get into property developing which is a great thing to be in without having to put yourself on the line because you're going to have to put yourself on the line on the line and if you've got a home uh, with a, a you know a family in it that house is on the line too don't don't take don't think any different to that you've got to be super careful that the deal is good enough in the first place. But isn't that good in a way? Because it's taking away lots of the risk and it, it, you know, it means that you're in a safer position, doesn't it? it, it the pro you, if the deal is good enough, and you might decide that this is the one deal that is gonna really set me up in life and I'm gonna go for it. And if you do that, that's, that's, that's your decision. But remember, you know, there's other people involved probably. There's family, it could be children involved. And they, they can, whatever you do can affect them. So you've really got to make sure <coughs> that the deal is good enough and look at the downside before you get into it. But you have to do that anyway, John, don't you? <coughs> because at the end of the day, um, you're investing money to generate a return and you're taking responsibility to make that successful. Yes. And the reason why personal guarantees are required is to lower the risk from the lender's point of view. I so thought you'd sure say you that. could refuse that. Yeah but the rate of interest will go up and the risk increases and they might not lend to you. No. And I think it's quite sensible um, that the person responsible for delivering the project has their s skin in the game. Yeah. You know, and, and if it doesn't work out, that yeah. they end up losing as well as the well, lenders and the investors. I think it, it makes people sit up and realise how serious it is, yeah. Richard. And from that point of view, I think it, it's good. But, but, but you know, it, it is a very, 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 very serious serious situation and one that doesn't mustn't be taken lightly I agree um, and the standard of the deal must be good enough and high enough to to deal with um, to make it worthwhile uh, really. one of the overriding points we always make in, in property summits when we're talking or doing these shows is that you must treat your property investments as a business absolutely whether it's one deal yeah. or multiple deals 
we're always getting the message across that there's so many elements and so many areas of risk um, that you need to be on top of your game in every aspect from tax, corporate structure, financing, uh, mortgages, risk to yourself, PGs, it, it never ends almost. Um, so you've got to take it really seriously. And I suppose wherever you're getting your funding from, whether it's the bank or one of these alternative sources, you've got to make sure you're not overstretched, Absolutely. I guess. Absolutely, Absolutely. Yeah. Now, most of these, most, a lot of these banks these days um, and lending institutions are cautious lenders in a way. They will try and make sure, won't you, Richard? You, I mean, you wouldn't lend to anyone who you felt was, being, was overstretched, no, for instance. Yeah. I think that's the key thing. The, the lender or the investor is, has, is more interested in getting their money back than, than you are as a developer. Yeah. So it's actually a good way to find out whether a deal is good. Absolutely. Is that if, you can't, if you can't source the funding, then Don't. it's probably not worth doing because no. the people judging that development or that buy to let have done many more than you have, even more than you have, John. Yeah. So you know, use your lenders and your, yeah, perhaps, your um, fund funding partners as advisors because they have people who know what they're talking about. It's a really good point, actually, isn't that, it? That, yeah, that's that's a really good point, and and it's so it's just so important to to emphasise that you know it, they, if someone doesn't want to do the deal, lend you the money, then probably you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. We well, need and to I change think, it. And some people need to hear that. I get so many people come to me for advice and help, who show me no fear. They show no fear. All they see is the upside, and that's seriously dangerous. You need to see, be balanced and see both sides of it. What to, you know, always have an out before you have an in. Always know what you're going to do if it goes wrong. And things do go wrong. Uh, you know, you show me a property investor, developer, who's been around for a while, who has not had a disaster, or says they haven't, and I'll show you a liar. It happens. And it's how you deal with those problems is the difference, really, between success and failure. Yeah, I agree. Having, having multiple exit options, I think, is critical as a developer. <coughs> you know, with, with things like a pandemic hit, if you're a traditional builder that's building flats or converting flats or whatever, if you can't sell those, you need to rent them out. So you need to understand your plan B, uh, and that's a viable exit. You know, you could then refinance the debt based on the rental income, and you can carry on building, carry on your business. So having multiple exit options is really important too. And I suppose, Paul, if you're um, in it for the long game, you're in a more protect protected position, aren't you? If you don't need to exit in a hurry and get your money out, then that gives you a buffer zone, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, if, you know, if, if you're looking at you know, your sort of standard buy to let, you're, you're much less likely to lose money than uh, than in property development. As a broad statement, I'd say. Um, but then again, in saying that, a lot of people who are interested in standard buy to let also look at these types of investments, you know, the more short term thing. And I think from their perspective, it's about understanding risk, you know, and I don't think many people do really understand the risk associated with their investments. But at the end of the day, if you want no risk, then put your money in the bank up to 85 grand and get half a percent return. Anything you earn over that, you're taking some risk. And usually the well, not always, but usually the risk is relative to the reward. So, you know, if you're getting a higher return, you're taking more risk for that higher return. And you need to understand whether you can afford that risk. Um, you know, there was mention there of personal guarantees and the fact you can lose money. A lot of people get worried. I find a lot of people will see when they're sort of investing, for example, through a limited company, and they're asked for a personal guarantee. They think that's a concern. Now, it can be a concern, but only if you don't make your repayments. And if you borrow in your own name, you're essentially giving a personal guarantee anyhow, which is what John mentioned. You know, so yes, you, you, do need to, uh, you need to understand that when you borrow money, you're taking risk. Um, you know, another thing a lot of people mention to me is, oh, I don't want to associate any debt with my home. Well, regardless of whether it's secured against your home or not, your home's an asset that you own. And if they fire sell your buy to let, then your home is at risk. And you need to understand that. But and then I suppose the opposite side of the coin is taking no risk is a risk. Because you know if you never take any risk, you're probably not gonna have a lot of money. Um, and that's not a fun position to be in either. So you, know, you, you need to understand what your risk profile is as an investor. You know, that often that's somewhat associated with your resources. If you're earning a lot of money, you can probably afford a little bit more risk and do things a bit more quickly. If you're not, then maybe you need to be a little bit more 
stringent um, and, and conservative, at least when you're first getting started. You know, I'm a big believer that when people are starting out, they shouldn't be taking huge amounts of risk. Because if you've only got 50 grand to your name and you lose that 50 grand, well, you're probably going to be once bitten, twice shy. You want to start with a, you know, a foot in the right direction. And then you can build a new level of risk, regardless of what we're talking about. Do you think that um, once the banks and the traditional lenders get back to the same kind of levels as, that they were before in terms of you know, providing funding, that people will need these alternative sources in the same way? I don't think they'll ever get back to what they were before. No. <clears throat> I mean, there might be certain banks at certain times that will raise their level of leverage, but um, I think the days of 85, 90, 95% lending are, are long gone because of the financial crisis. So these alternative sources will always be available. Um, and I think, you know, the opportunity for everyday people to lend to developers in the same way banks have done for many years is a good opportunity. Mm. It's remarkable. It's remarkable, yeah. Richard, really. It's an incredibly clever, innovative thing to do. Uh, and you're at the forefront of it, of course. And, uh, but Paul mentioned something interesting there about um, taking too much of a risk if you've only got a certain amount of money. One of the things that the platforms do is they enable you to, if I've got £50,000 to invest, I could lend it all to Nick, but I'd rather lend 10 to you and 10 to you and 10 to you so and 10 to you. Splitting your so risk. Absolutely, yeah. diversifying yeah. your risk, because yeah. one of those projects will go wrong. Yeah. And not completely wrong, but there will be problems with one of the yeah. projects. Sorry, Nick. But well, at least you're pointing at me when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> so supposing I've got £50,000 and I want to do something with it. If I gave it to, to you, um, would you advise me what to do with it, whether to put it into one investment or to split it? How does that work? We're not allowed to give advice, and none of the platforms are allowed to give advice, so it has to be your decision about where you invest. There are some platforms where they auto-invest, so you put £50,000 in and it spreads it across each of the loans as they come onto the, the platform based on your criteria. But it has to be your decision. In my view, you're taking the risk and you should make the decision. It's our job to provide all the information you need to be able to see whether it's a good investment or not and how much you want to invest. But certainly it's better, I think, to spread your risk across multiple investments. And take my 50 grand again, 50,000 pounds. Is it better for me to give it to you and we, we invest it that way? Or is it better to put it into a, a two bedroom terrace? Paul, what's your, what are your thoughts? Um, look, I think the benefit of putting it into the, the platform is you're definitely going to get more diversification if you're splitting it across five different things, for example. But, but I also think that diversification is probably an overused term when it comes to investing to the point where it dilutes returns for people who often can't afford to dilute returns, if that makes sense. So the reason I like buy to let is mainly due to the leverage. You know, you can take your 50 grand, you can buy a 200,000 pound property using a 75% mortgage, which means if you get relatively average returns associated with that property, you're going to get you know 20% plus returns on the cash you've invested per annum um, when you consider net yields and, and average capital growth. So if you buy a decent property in a decent area, you, you know, you're getting some really good returns without setting the world on fire or doing anything too creative. Um, and you know, that good property is likely to be rented most of the time and likely to grow in value. So even if you underperform, you still do okay. Okay, well, that's all we've got time to. Uh, what's quite clear is that there are so many ways now to get finance. So you're no longer reliant just on the banks. Uh, so thank you very much for your expertise, gentlemen, as always. But that's all we've got time for for now. Bye-bye.